All right, Lisa. Lisa, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, born and raised in Riverside, California. I grew up amongst the orange groves in a working class neighborhood. Tell me about your family. Well, if you saw my parents, um, they look like they came straight out of a 1950s magazine. <clears throat> they look um, innocent and safe, but they were anything but safe. Tell me. Yeah, so um, I'm the youngest of three. My brother and sister are older. Uh, they were adopted because my mom couldn't have kids, which is fine. I'm, I'm a miracle. Um, but that became an issue in our family because my parents are dysfunctional and made it an issue. But um, my earliest memory is of... I, I guess I was about five and I was looking over my mom, which I know now she had attempted suicide, but um, I didn't know was, what was going on then. But my parents divorced when I was five and they were very contentious with each other and, you know, put us in the middle and, you know, try to make each other look bad. Um, but my mom, I guess, went away for a little bit. My grandmother came and stayed with us. About the only time I saw my grandmother in my childhood. And... Um, my mom came back a party woman. She was a singles woman at this point. So it became all about the singles world. And a woman, a single mother with issues is a pedophile magnet. And um, that's exactly what my mother was. And so the first clear memory I have of being sexually abused was um, from John. And he was super helpful to my mom, came around the house and, you know, did whatever she wanted. And my mom thought it was a good idea to work evenings. So we were alone in the evenings. And John would come and see me in the evenings. And so I, you know, pedophiles are always looking for opportunities besides the fact that I was there alone without a parent. I was starving for affection. My own father wouldn't give me affection. I asked him for hugs and he was just very cold and distant. And uh, so John, John was there to give me attention and ice cream. And one day he's like, Lisa, let's go get ice cream. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, I like ice cream. Let's go get it. <laughs> but instead of going to Thrifty's ice cream, he went into a field and it was different in the field than at home. And all I remember really is just the, the look in his eyes changing to, I don't know, more primal. And just being in this car with him and <clears throat> yeah. And at the end, he, he looks at me and he says, do you love your mom? Yeah, you know, I'm five, I love my mom. Um, do you want your mom to live? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he said, if I, say anything about what happened, then, you know, she'll die. So, but I, I didn't know what to say. Uh, I don't have words. I don't know what penises, vagina, sex, petting. I don't know anything. So I don't know what to say. Um, so I, I didn't say anything. And the next day or the next week, he came back over, brought me crayons and a coloring book and so, you know, I'm excited for that, and I start coloring, and he starts to proceed to molest me, and he has his hands up my, my little dress, and my sister comes pounding in the living room, and, like, she's pissed. She's, like, five years older than me, so she's a 10-year-old girl, and she's like, what is going on? And looking at me, you know, like, it's my fault, and I just, I, I don't know what's going on. What's going on? I don't, again, I don't have words for it, and um, so... John pulls his hand out and jumps up and leaves. The next day or so, my um, sister has my mom and John gathered around the kitchen table and they call me in and she says, Lisa, what happened? And I, again, I don't have words. I'm avoiding looking at John. I, I have nothing to say, so that's it. But it was my sister who was angry and she ended up telling my father. And when my father came over, he uh, said, Lisa, I understand that, you know, John molested you and just, you know, just don't make a big deal about it. 
to like a big deal. And you know, a five, like, like okay, I, I don't even know, you know, a five-year-old brain, what's going on making a big deal about it. So, um, so that's, that's my first experience with a pedophile. Then my mom um, connected with a guy named Larry. And Larry felt that it was his, you know, moral obligation to raise us girls to not be frigid when we grew up. I remember him telling me that, like, you know, I don't want you to be frigid when you get older. And I, I don't know what frigid meant. <laughs> you know, I was like, refrigerator? I don't know. And um, so he, it's my brother, sister, and myself, and uh, my mom, and he thought that he would start by showing us uh, how to not be frigid, I guess, by going to nudist camps. So Glen Eden Sun Club um, was a place that he took us, which is super awkward, and we didn't want to get naked, and we protested, and it was gross and weird, but uh, you, even though it's a family nudist camp, nobody can have their clothes on, so um, so here we are, there, you know, a bunch of kids naked, just awkwardly looking at each other, and I was kind of freaked out because I didn't know, I'm trying not to look, but why does that man look different from that man? I, I have no idea. Um, but we, we tried to have fun, and, um, you know, it turns out that nudist camps are pedophile magnets. Go figure. And there's a, a, a pool for little kids and then the bigger pool. You had to earn your dolphin tag for that. So in the little pool was manned by, I don't know, the hairy guy. And he, you know, us kids would line up and he would take turns, you know, throwing us into the deep end. And, but, you know, uh, accidentally, uh, not accidentally grab, you know, my crotch area or something. I'm sure other kids, he did that too as well. And then in the big pool was a guy named, we, we nicknamed the doctor. Um, he wore goggles and we would be swimming and he would swim underneath and we just knew, you know, so we like part the water and try to get out. So that was a regular experience going to Glen Eden with Larry and my mom. And then when we would get home, um, he felt that it was important apparently to actually show us what sex was. Again, I... I don't remember that word being used, but he and um, called me in the room once, and I know now what was happening. They were having sexual intercourse and just told me to sit down and watch. And then another time um, on our kitchen table, he calls all of us kids in and is having sex with my mother on the kitchen table and gives my brother a camera to take pictures. And. You know, we're just goofy, awkward kids. It's, I, I don't know. So um, he proceeds to, you know, this goes on. And sometimes we went to his place. And when we went to his place, uh, it seemed like he liked to take my sister alone in the room with him and my mom and my brother. And I just bummed around his place. And then I know that I was alone with them at least once. All I remember is... Um, him showing me a sex toy, him and my mom, and then afterwards I knew what it was and how to use it at five. And so that wasn't all, you know, Larry um, asked me one day to make him a bath and he was gonna show me how to bathe him. So I dutifully went to the bathroom. Now Larry had a problem with my brother. My brother was a little cusser. Okay, my brother's about three and a half years older than me. I guess he didn't like Larry. And so he told him something like, fuck you, Larry, you know, and Larry was like, no, this was not okay with him. And so he's naked, I'm standing by the bathroom, my brother comes out and he grabs my brother by the ankles and he picks him up and he starts dipping his head in the toilet like he's waterboarding him. And I'm just, I'm just heartbroken and terrified for my brother and um, helpless. And so um, then my brother runs off, you know, in shame and humiliation. And Larry says, Lisa, come in here and um, proceeded to show me how to bathe him, you know, in all areas. So that relationship didn't last, even though my mom blamed us kids, you know, <laughs> but 
good. I'm glad Larry's gone. However, the early sexualization and the um, the violence, the anger, you know, just rolled downhill. And who's at the bottom? So my brother, I know my siblings are victims as well, but um, what ended up happening is it started to become not just my brother, but a neighborhood um, game, like let's pants Lisa. So it would go from, you know, we're playing hide and go seek or something, and now it's time to pants Lisa. And so I would start running and I would always do my best to get away, but I, I was never successful. And um, we'd end up in, in a room in the house and uh, they'd rip off my clothes, one boy on each arm and leg and rip my legs open and start experimenting, poking, laughing, ignoring ignoring me. And, um, you know, th that went on, I don't know how long, I'm, I'm thinking until my stepdad came into our lives. But, you know, <laughs> Once you are kind of labeled as, in my mind, I, I think of it as like you're be, you're used. So fair game, you know. So I was like fair game for the boys in the neighborhood. I couldn't just ride my bike down the street. Sometimes I could, but sometimes I couldn't. And Keith and Craig would grab me off my bike and drag me into their house or come in my backyard. And Ron, you know, would try to get me to do sexual things with him. It was just a, um, a chaotic mess of a neighborhood. And things weren't, were, were bad, they were bad. One day um, before school, there was a knock at the door and I, I answered it and there's this guy with this big smile, fuller brush salesman. And um, he's like, is your mom home? And I'm like, yeah. And I, anyway, I came home that day and he was still there. And so this guy became my stepdad. And he, he was my best parent. He could have been a pedophile, but that wasn't his thing. He liked my mom. <laughs> and um, Larry actually, not Larry, Ray, um, tried to parent us. And so he uh, I pretty much put a stop to my brother's assaults. And um, I guess I cried a lot as a child. Um, as he reminded me as an adult, like, Lisa, you would always be crying. And, but what, but Ray, what Ray did is he would come in the room and he would pick me up and carry me to my mom's bed and lay me next to her. And then he would go lay on the couch. And um, she never gave me a hug or brushed my hair out of my eyes or anything like that. But just Ray giving me that nurturing was very special. It gave me a sense of what real affection from a parent would look like. Unfortunately, he was a merchant marine and so he would be gone like six months out of the year. And um, so when he was gone, things were worse, but I was always there dropping him off at the port of Los Angeles and picking him up. Uh, we had a good time together. <laughs> um, he was street smart, you know, so we got schooled streetwise ways. But anyway, so that was, I was nine when he came into our lives. And he left when I was 12. But in the meantime, while, when, when he was on the ship, I guess, my sister went back east to visit our grandmother. And on the way back, she met a couple on a train, Don and Jody. And uh, I guess they found out that they're talking to this teenage girl that, oh my gosh, we go to nudist camps too. That we, she went to nudist camps, they go to nudist camps. And um, somehow it became the plan that they're going to take me to nudist camp. I'm 11 years old. And um, my mom's like, Lisa, your sister met this couple and they're going to take you to Glen Eden. And I said, no, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to Glen Eden. <laughs> I don't want to get naked in front of people again. But she said, you're going. So I'm in my bedroom and they come in to the house and I hear them laughing and yucking it up in the kitchen. And my mom calls me out and they're like, oh, you're Lisa. OK, well, let's go. You know, and I'm sure Jody saw my hesitation. She's like, come on, let's race. Let's race to the truck. And so, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for an opportunity to run or something. Um, 
play a game. And so we raced to the truck and I'm sure she beat me. And then they're like, here, sit in the middle. And so Dawn's here, Jody's here, I'm in the middle. And they have a pack of marbles on the dashboard. And um, she's like, you want a cigarette? And so I had been a regular smoker of cigarettes since, since I was eight, but I had never smoked in front of adults. And uh, of course I drank and smoked weed when I could as well. Um, but I'm, I'm like, you sure it's okay for me to smoke with you guys? Yeah, it's fine, no problem. So I was like puffing away on the way to Glen Eden. And um, so then we get there and you have to get naked again. So of course it's a race, who can get naked the quickest? You know, same scenario, awkward place, uncomfortable. Um, and then they take me to their apartment. And they're like, Lisa, by the way, the rules are the same in our apartment as at Glen Eden. It's a no clothes zone. So it's a game. As soon as the door is closed, who can get their clothes off the fastest, right? So, okay. So now we're all naked in the apartment. But, you know, they had Atari. They had cigarettes. I didn't have to go figuring out a way to get them. And they had alcohol. Sometimes marijuana. Um, but I guess it was okay. I was feeling like... Maybe, you know, maybe it's okay. And uh, I don't know, the next day or the next week, um, Jody uh, was at work and I had to be alone with Dawn. I didn't want to be alone with Dawn. I wanted to be with Jody. She was cool. She was a basketball player. And, um, <clears throat> but we went shopping and then we went to go pick Jody up. And as we're waiting, he says to me, Lisa, your sister said that you want to have sex with me. And I'm freaked out. I'm petrified, um, thinking, no, and oh my gosh, you know, like I'm in trouble. Like did, I did something wrong. I gave the wrong impression. I'm 11. He's like 39, maybe 40. And um, I said, no, no, you know, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why she said that. And um, so he's like, it's, it's okay. It's all right that you want to have sex with me. Uh, I don't want to have sex with you. And so then, you know, my mind starts racing and I think in my 11 year old brain that Jody's going to be mad um, and I don't want her to be upset. So I asked him, please, please don't tell Jody. And um, so uh, he just kind of smirks at me, but agrees. He agrees. And I um, feel some relief. But as soon as she gets in the car, he said, hey, guess what? Lisa wants to have sex with me. And she immediately says, great, yeah, no problem. And I don't want that. I'm, what can I say? I, I don't know. No, but we drive on and we get back to their apartment. And, you know, all pedophiles are philosophers, you know, don't be frigid and like, you know, they're going to do me favors. And uh, my mom's crazy. Lisa, you know, your mom's crazy, right? And and Jody told me, you know, if your dad, if you had a good relationship with your dad, you'd want to have sex with him. And I asked Don, like, do you do you want me to call you dad? Uh, but he just smirked. And so they started engaging me in sexual activities, uh, but I was definitely reluctant. And um, so Jody's like, come on, takes me by the hand. Like, you, all you have to do is watch this time. And so I'm just laying in bed and while they're having sex, watching. And um, then it proceeds to dawn, like, comes and holds me. And then it proceeds to engaging me in sexual activities, touch, oral sex. But Don wanted me to voluntarily say, please, please be my first. Um, but I was not, that was not my interest. I was not interested in that. So part of the way that he um, tried to get me to be comfortable with that idea was he had me watch Pretty Baby, the movie uh, where Brooke Shields was a child and she was molested in the film. Um, it's child pornography. She's naked in it. She's auctioned off her virginity at 12 years old. Um, it's a whorehouse. Everyone's happy, of course. Everything's great. And in the movie, the whole time, she's totally fine. She's great. She's happy. It doesn't affect her. Um, and that's definitely what 
I, I got the message, it's not supposed to affect me. It's not a big deal. It's only a big deal if you make it a big deal, right? So I don't, I, I don't know Don's brain, I don't know, but it became a regular uh, occurrence, him sitting down with me watching Pretty Baby. And um, during this time, you know, he's touching me. Uh, sometimes Jody's there, he's touching Jody and you know, sexually and always like indoctrination. And, you know, part of his thing was, you know, Lisa, it would actually be, you know, difficult for me. I would be doing you a favor. And, you know, once it happens, like it's no big deal. And he even introduced me to a girl. He said that he did the same thing for and see, she's fine. Um, so whatever. Um, they took me on a... Um, three state camping trip, just the two of them and I, and one day- Let me uh, ask, how did your mom consent to all of this? I don't know. She just told me to go with them. She didn't ask me what happened. She knew we were going to nudist camps and that I would go to their house just about every weekend for a couple of years. And then on this camping trip, so. Uh, I'm assuming my father consented as well, at least by omniscient, right? He wasn't checking up. So I, I don't know anything more than that. Crazy. But um, <clears throat> so we go on this camping trip and, you know, back then, <laughs> this is before the Internet and before um, cell phones and all that. But he had his projector and he had pretty baby. And uh, we're watching it at a campground and whatever. So one day we were at Flagstaff, Arizona, and it's the daytime and I wake up and I'm drunk or something. And so I, I'm, I, don't, I don't understand, I'm not orientated. And so I kind of get out of the camper and I stumble around and I'm looking for Don and Jody and I found, find them and they, um, like, Lisa, what are you doing? You know, get back in there. You're going to get us in trouble. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, thinking back now, I do wonder at what was in the alcohol sometimes. Um, but, you know, consciously, you know, he wanted me to, to make choices. So, like, I'm full on board, right? But um, sometimes it wasn't just me there. There was sometimes other girls and one day Don says, I'm gonna take you to be a model. And I was like, no, no, it's okay. You know, I'm, I think of myself, I, I was like, I was, thought I was fat and ugly, I'm an ogre. You know, I look back now at pictures of me and I'm just a skinny kid, not sexy. <laughs> just a awkward 12, 13 year old, you know, but, um, He's like, no, 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 I'm gonna take you girls and we'll get your picture taken. So we go and I'm in the back of his truck with a shell on it and just kind of waiting. And at the time, you know, like I never knew where I was going. Uh, I knew I was in Santa Ana with them. I knew I was in Riverside back home. That's about it. I could get around town in Riverside walking, but uh, I'm in the back of the truck and uh, I, I hear a voice. And the voice has um, memorized how to get there. I'm just like, whatever, shake it off. And I'm just in the back of the pickup truck and I hear it again. It's kind, it's firm. And it says, memorize how to get there. So I do. I open up the window at the side of the shell and I'm looking and I'm like 7th Street, 7th Street, 14th Street, 14th Street. You know, I'm memorizing how to get there. And then we pull up and like, I can still see it in my, in my head, like a two story office building, stairs outside, that ugly tan bricks and the uh, studios on the second story. And so, um, I don't know if it was 319, but anyway, so we kind of rushed up us girls, you know, kind of racing each other, right? Everything's a game. And um, we walk in the studio and I see this uh, guy sitting there and kind of a very long, almost, like a table desk, but a very long desk. And in the middle of it is a Rubik's cube. And so I'm like, 
a Rubik's Cube, can I play with it? And we met, our eyes met, and it was just, his look was so cold and mean and, I don't know, intense, that it just kind of shocked me. I looked away and I just sat down. And I didn't say anything else. I just, you know, one by one, we all got our headshots, clothes, clothes on, that's it. And um, then we're out of there, <laughs> yeah, goodbye. And the next day, it's just me and Don and Jody at their apartment. And I hear Don on the phone with this photographer. Somehow I know it's a photographer. And he says, yeah, yeah, Lisa will do nude pictures. And I was like, I don't know. I'm always trying to say no, right? I'm like, no, I won't. And he turns and he looks at me with that similar look, like, shut up, and points to the couch for me to sit down. And, um, you know, again, like, like looking back now, there was always a camera out. Don always had a camera. And apparently, you know, there was probably a lot of pictures of me naked and they sometimes dress me up, even pose me. But I don't know, it was a game where I didn't really think of it like voluntarily or something. This just seemed like, no, I'm not going to volunteer for that. <laughs> you could at least ask. Um, but it took me home and I, I go to school for the week. Now, my grades have at this point completely tanked. I'm failing completely out of junior high school. I, um, I did good in elementary school. Uh, the only class I'm passing is PE because I love sports. And so um, also, you know, kind of like I, I became like the target in the neighborhood. I don't know, that carried on. You know, I would go to parties with friends, older high school boys, and, you know, a victim just gets taken advantage a lot. And then I, I became the target or the, the slut, the school slut. Literally, people called me slut. So I'm the slut and yeah, whatever. But, but anyway, I, I didn't go very much. And so one day, I was there and I'm at PE and I get called to the office. Now, I go into the office and uh, Miss Brewer usually was glaring at me, didn't like me because of my shoddy attendance. Um, but this time she kind of has like a sad look, kind of mm, compassionate. She's like, Lisa, these are um, detectives are here to talk to you. And again, I don't, I don't know what to think or say, but um, we go into a room. She's my support person, you know, even though she hated my guts. <laughs> and they just start asking me questions. Do you know Don Gordon, Jody Jones? Yes. And I don't remember all the questions, but were you naked with them? Did you have oral sex? Did you have sexual intercourse? Did you just finger in you? All those questions. And um, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, I if I should be answering them or not, but <sighs> confused. Anyway, at the end, Detective Mendoza said, um, you're, you're gonna go in a, a shelter home because your home environment, I don't know, I have to investigate it or something like that, which surprised me because I don't know, you're, just, you're in denial about your life, it's not, nothing abnormal, you know? And so um, I'm still in my PE clothes and He's like, well, you know, we're going to need to talk to your mom. And it turns out that day, my mom was actually picking me up. Usually I ride my bike to school. and um, But she, I said, well, my mom's picking me up. And the school was just letting out. You could hear the bell. It rang. And he's like, really? Okay. So he sent the other detective to go get her. And then she meets with me in the office. And uh, she's like, Lisa and reaches out to me and embraces me and says, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And I just felt like so much shame and humiliation and tell her what? I still, I don't know, I didn't know, but I know looking back, like why was that so weird? You know, but my mom never hugs me, <laughs> so. That was one reason why that was so weird. 
Um, but Detective Mendoza took me to shelter home and um, was very kind to me. He um, made sure that I was able to continue to play sports. I was an all-star catcher for this girls softball team. And I, I, don't, I didn't know why at the time, but um, I had to have a sheriff's escort which was very awkward and uncomfortable. And like, I'm in a shelter home now. Ugh. So I'm always like the weird girl, you know? And, um, but I was able to play sports, which I was really grateful for. And um, he took me out to dinner with his family a couple times and tried to kind of, you know, like Lisa, it'll be all right. You know, you can still have a good life, that sort of thing. One day, um, a social worker showed up and took me to Orange County for those detectives to interview me. And I get there and one detective takes me in the room and he says, uh, so there's this photographer. I guess he knew, I don't, I don't know how he knew what I, whatever, but um, he knew about this photographer and he said, you know, and Don and Jody um, said they don't know how to get there. They don't know where he's at. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, before I had a chance to say, I memorized how to get there, he said, um, and this photographer, Lisa, is wanted for killing children. And he starts to tell me details, like a boy was tied up in a chair and, um, and, and a, a girl was found in a couple dumpsters. And I'm not even, I don't, it's just, I don't, how do you take in that information? And um, so w when he finished explaining a little bit, I said, well, I memorized how to get there. And he said, you did. I said, yeah. He's like, let's go right now. And so we went and I'm like 7th Street, 14th Street. I took him right to the same studio and um, walked him right up to it. And there's these two big detectives and me. I'm 13 at this time and they knock on the door. And I'm thinking, okay, is this guy gonna end up killing me? Because I don't know, he's gonna see that it's me showing, um, but there was no answer. They didn't bust down the door. Um, we just left. But I always wondered like, was he looking through a people or something? I, I don't know. And then um, they took me back to Riverside and that was it. You know, I think it's an example of how I always want to be helpful with the system, with, you know, fighting good against evil, doing the right thing. But victims aren't considered. So it would have been nice for somebody to check on me and let me know if the photographer uh, got busted or if he's on the run uh, or what. But nobody ever told me. So a few months later, I kind of took this as a sign from the universe. They used to have editorials back then and um, it was Hal Fishman. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was, he was talking about some victim and their courage and show, showing something, the detectives and some child pornography ring got busted. And thanks to the victim. And I was like, wow, I wonder, you know, was that because of me? I have no idea. But, um, you know, I, n I never heard anything otherwise. Um, but near the end of the summer, Detective Mendoza tells me, Lisa, I, I have to take you back home. I don't want to. Um, I feel that your mom is the worst kind of abuser, but um, I don't have a choice. Like they're not gonna let me keep you in the system. So he, I gather my stuff and he drives me home and he tries to give me a pep talk. I know he didn't want to do it, but he had to do it. And there I go, right back into the home. And you know, no therapy, no follow up, nothing. So my family being the family that they are, uh, I was looked down on, not for being a victim of sexual abuse, but for, uh, like, especially according to my dad, you know, um, especially if you're a man, if you want to have sex with a man, a woman, a child, that's fine. Like, that's like the religion that he lived and that I might be responsible for somebody getting busted for that definitely made him look down on me more. So 
And my mom just called me a slut. And my siblings, you know, I don't know, they're out of their minds, you know, doing their own things. But I somehow gathered up like the determination that like, I'm gonna do good in ninth grade. I'm I'm like, I'm not getting involved with anybody again, and I'm I'm gonna do good in ninth grade. And I looked up to my sister and I uh, she played volleyball and she was in drama and choir and I um so that's what I was gonna do. That was my plan. And I actually got on on the honor roll in ninth grade. And I tried out for volleyball, having never played before, and fell in love. And I got on the, uh, I lettered as a freshman. And I was in heaven, sort of. I mean, home life still sucked, right? I'm still getting high every day, drinking when I can, whatever. I'm a total smoker. Um, and uh, this guy, you know, we lived, like, they, these people lived right behind us, longtime friends, and their older son moved back home. He was cute way older than me, I'm not interested, but I did have a crush, but I'm never gonna do anything about that. But anyway, he comes around a lot and you know, you get the gist. Long story short, he and my sister are like, hey, let's go for a ride. And that's when I got introduced to methamphetamines. So uh, meth, wow. Uh, he's like, Lisa, here's some meth, you know, and uh, if you're having a hard time sleeping, duh. Uh, you can come over to my house in the middle of the night and we'll play games. <laughs> okay. So um, one night I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna go over there and play games. Cause I'm just like tweaking out of my brain and bored. So we did, we actually started to play a game. And um, then before I know it, he started kissing me. And I did, I did feel flattered at first. I was like, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> I'm 14 and like, he seems so cool, but then it like progressed really, really fast and became very instructional from him to me. And um, then when we were done, he's like, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. And I just crawl back out of his window and I go home. And I thought in my naive, forever naive brain, oh my gosh, we're boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> But I'm terrified that people are going to find out because I'm the slut and there's more confirmation that that's the case. So um, I told him, I said, Glenn, um, nobody can find out about this. So he's like, oh, no problem. <laughs> nobody will find out. So that, that worked out for him. And he's like, you know what? Come back over tonight and bring your volleyball uniform. So, um, okay. And I, I brought my volleyball uniform and he's like, go ahead and put it on. But I'm like super awkward to change into it, which he thinks is kind of funny, you know. And I do, and he took some pictures of me in my volleyball uniform. And then he had other outfits to wear and then it became just naked pictures. And, you know, over time, like it progressed to uh, pictures, you know, involving sex acts. and. You know, I started to really get the impression that, you know, he's not my boyfriend and uh, because he's a philosopher, too, you know, and he would say things like, Lisa, um, you know, when you get married, when you're older, you know, I'll take you to the wedding chapel. And, and that actually hurt my heart because I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, I want to marry you. Um, and and then when you get divorced, I'll take you to the divorce attorneys. And so it didn't. I, I didn't want to participate with him anymore, um, but he couldn't let it go. But I told him, um, you, you got to get rid of those pictures. You know, somebody's going to find them and then I'm going to be confirmed again a slut, I guess. And he, uh, but I stopped, I stopped meeting up with him. And he said, well, Lisa, if you want to get rid of some old pictures, then you can do some new pictures. We'll get rid of 10 pictures, you do five new pictures. And I just, I, I didn't want to do that. And so I just did my best to avoid him, but he's in the neighborhood and he's coming around my house. And my mom had a boyfriend that was coming around the house and he's trying to get me to go to Vegas to be a prostitute. And just like, so I, I avoided home as much as possible and, um, Yes, of course, you know, I'm just like this clueless young girl victim getting assaulted at parties and not, not a good situation. 
just like a hot mess. Um, of course, high school, um, one quarter on the honor roll, and then, uh, you know, it turns out that perpetrators don't really care about your grades or your sports. And so I um, went to continuation school, couldn't hack that, and I'm on independent study. But by this time, I had a friend, I would hang out at his house, Andy, we were buds. And um, there was a guy up there that he was just 10 years older than me, and I was 14. Um, but he told Andy's mom that he wanted, you know, more of a relationship with me. And with her encouragement, I guess eventually, you know, I told her I'm not interested. And I told him I'm not. I'm just, like, trying to hang out. You know, we'd go to the beach. He'd surf. I'd sunbathe. And um, But anyway, by the time I was 15, we're boyfriend and girlfriend. But, hey, at least he called me his girlfriend. But it was the same situation, you know, as Glenn. And... Um, just just not my life was a mess and I'm I, I had I, I didn't I wanted to be sober but I had no idea how I could ever be sober and so I'm just cycling through like weed every day alcohol when I can of course I'm a total smoker meth if I can get it was or, your mom using drugs not that I know of um, pills pills um, and she still looked like, um, you know, she had like that up down hair and her perfect makeup and dressed in business and whatever. Our house was always perfectly clean and she always made sure. Sometimes we have to get up in the middle of the night and clean it. And so my house, that's how it looked. It was always in order. But um, no, I'm just out about doing drugs. <laughs> and... But this guy, Bob, my boy, my boyfriend, um, his family was really nice and they were Christian and they knew what we were doing, but they were still really nice, you know, and um, they're like, hey, you can play sports at the church. So I'm like, OK, any opportunity to play sports because uh, I really missed out. <laughs> and um, then they started just talking to me about prayer and I was always believing in God and um but I hadn't heard of the Bible. I mean, I had heard of the Bible, but I didn't know anything about or Ten Commandments and stuff. So anyway, I started praying more specifically. And I gained strength. Like, I, I started going to church, and I, I was able to just quit using substances. I had, like, a new, new people to hang out with, and I found, like, this inner strength somehow to break up with Bob. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Um, but one day I was praying, actually, I guess before I was able to quit everything. Anyway, I had a spiritual experience and I knew in this prayer, I had this distinct feeling that, that God said, Lisa, you can stay on the path you're on and my love for you is no less, but you're not going to get sober. It's going to get worse. You're going to die early, be a prostitute or some variation thereof, overdose something. Or you can go on this path. And this path is a clean and sober path where I, I don't have to be dealing with all of these perverts anymore. So for me, it's a no-brainer. And I went on this path. And so then... Um, so basically, I just started hanging out with church people, young people my age, and I was working. I, I was able to get a diploma, but they basically gave it to me because <laughs> uh, I, I didn't really earn it, I, sort of, but not really. And um, I started going to martial arts. Martial arts really filled that, you know, movement need I had. And then, um, then I meet my husband. And... He's a good Christian guy, and he, we started dating in a very different way than what I was used to, and I'm completely sober now, and I'm like, you know, he's showing more interest, and in our little world there, you know, it's marriage, it's the next step, and I told him, well, like, I have this past, and he's like, it's okay, it doesn't matter, <laughs> and so we ended up getting married. And I'm still, I'm still clean and sober. But after I had my first son, um, bam, man, the depression hit. And 
I, I wasn't well. <laughs> I was so well. I didn't really know where to go for help, but I'm like, well, I guess I better go to therapy. And um, that was my beginning of trying to get help. And it was sketchy. You know, back then there wasn't, it, now everyone's trauma informed. Everybody understands trauma and complex post-traumatic stress disorder and all that. But back then, like, nobody, nobody knew that. And, but there were some, like, I, I did go to, like, a sexual abuse recovery group, and I was like, you know, I think I want to be a therapist. <laughs> and I remember one of the girls saying, you know, Lisa, everybody wants to be a therapist in recovery. I'm like, okay, but I think I really do. And so um, I decided to become a therapist, and I started with one class at a time. But that was actually... I, I, I had, honestly, I was so anxious. I had so much anxiety um, that I, I couldn't complete the first two classes. I had to drop them. But the third class stuck, you know, and eventually I just kept going. But uh, before I even took my first class, um, I think I had my second son, and I get a call from the Orange County District Attorney's Office. And they asked me if I will testify on behalf of Don's newest victim. I mean, out of the blue. And I'm just trying to live my life, trying to manage my family and I'm, um, my husband's family. We both come from traumatic histories and, you know, it's a huge re-trigger. But they don't ask, hey, do you need anything? Are you okay? It's just like business, you're done. Oh, we don't need you to testify, it's over but it's a complete re-trigger. So um, about that time too, I had decided, oh my God, you know, like what the hell, you know, my childhood, what, you know, so I, I, I'm starting to get in touch with my anger because I can't let that anger go inwards and be depression. So I have to put the anger where it belongs because it doesn't belong on my children and it doesn't belong on my husband and it doesn't belong on me. So I decided I was gonna confront my abusers. But I, I couldn't find most of them. <laughs> I looked in the phone book, you know, this is before the internet. But you know, I'm like, I think I'm gonna confront my father. And so he comes over one day and I tell him what happened, John, Larry, Don and Jody and all, I mean, I know now thinking back like, he should know, anyway. Um, and he's like, wow, Lisa, you had quite an extensive sex life. And I was ugh, offended and hurt. And then before I had a chance to say anything, he said, and children under the age of three don't remember anything. And I, I didn't say anything about that. I was only talking about John, you know. And actually with my dad, um, I remember a couple times like growing up thinking because uh, my brother and sister went and lived with him a couple times but I remember thinking like I, I I would rather be on the streets of LA than live with my dad but I don't want to go on the streets of LA or Vegas <laughs> or anywhere um, by the grace of God I'm not um, but my father he um, Yeah, he liked young boys and he, he was a high school teacher. <laughs> and so one day after this experience, I was another high school teacher at the school he taught at got busted for molesting a boy. And um, I guess I was still naive and I was like, dad, oh my gosh, Mr. Gurgis got busted for molesting a boy. And he's like, Lisa, every boy is gonna be masturbated at some point. And I was like, okay, um, just, you know, I never left any of my sons alone with him ever, not once. <laughs> and I eventually had to cut off that relationship. But my dad, you know, my dad was not proud of me becoming Christian. It wasn't my plan. I, I, I didn't do it for anything other than, that just saved me. Um, and, but he knew, he knew who I was. I was never rude to him like that. I mean, okay, I confronted him, but you know, he deserved it. And uh, anyway, 
As an adult, he would say the most awful, vulgar things to me that I won't repeat because I would feel guilty for putting it in your head. But one, one time he said to me, Lisa, I was in West Hollywood and I was going by a pornography uh, theater and I saw your name, Lisa Bear. It's my maiden name. And like, did you do the film? Like, I didn't get a chance to go in and see it, you know, because I was out of time, but I totally would have. So, I don't know, I guess he just liked the shock value or something. We decided at some point that, you know, I needed to get out of Riverside and farther away from my family. So we moved up to the high desert, <laughs> to Adelanto, the armpit of the high desert. And um, it, was a, it was a big change and it was good. And then, um, you know, we looked around, we were able to buy our, our house in the Apple Valley and it was little, but it had a beautiful view. And so I'm still going to school and yeah. Anyway, the day after we moved into the house in Apple Valley, I'm at the grocery store and I have my youngest son, who's a toddler at the time in the car seat and I see Jody. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Yeah. Anyway, so I freaking out and I'm like, oh my God, please don't let her be my neighbor. You know, that's just, I just don't want him to be my neighbor. So um, I followed her. I waited for her to come back out. I have my poor son in the car <laughs> and I'm trying to follow her, but she loses me. I don't know. I don't think she knew I was following her, right? And I don't know where she went. So I knew at the time, Megan's Law, you had to go into the sheriff's office to get information and they didn't um, publish their addresses. But I go in and I um, tell them the situation. I just want to make sure she's not my neighbor. And um, they're like, we don't, we don't see her. We don't see her on Megan's Law. And I'm like, but I, I, know, I know the judge said that she had to register as a sex offender. And um, I said, well, so she molested me with this guy, Don Gordon. And, you know, they look him up and they're like, okay, what, have a seat. Where did you just move from? And they um, said that he had been paroled to Adelanto, where I was just living, which is a little town. And um, I remembered like a few months earlier on the radio, like KFI or something, hearing about like a Don Gordon and some other sex offender going, you know, being released into a Santa Ana neighborhood and the, the neighbors were like, no, we don't want him here, you know, kicking him out. And so I called the radio station to try to find out, but they didn't return my call. So I put it out of my head and um, just moved out of Atalanta. My son, one of my sons was still in soccer there, winning soccer team. And so they're like, okay, we'll have his parole officer contact you. The parole officer contacts me and um, comes over to my house. And he's like, why didn't you tell us where you live? I'm like, I did not know I was supposed to tell you where I live. Nobody ever told me anything. But basically, as a victim of his or of a sex offender, they cannot be paroled within 25 miles of you. Um, but I didn't know that. And so it became, it became this uh, really negative interaction with the parole officer because I told him, I said, you know, okay, I, I guess I realize this is a less than 1% chance, but just in case, just in case, Don, can you search him? Because you can do, he can do that at any time, he told me. Just make sure that he doesn't have a picture of me or a picture of my sons, please. Because <laughs> I'm trying not to think, but, you know, I'm sure he just thought I was crazy. But he said, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. You know, a few weeks pass, and I don't hear any information. So I called him up, and I said, so did you search him, you know? And he didn't even lie. And he said, no, no, I didn't search him. And I'm like, why? You know, like you missed that opportunity. Like if there was something there, you could have found it. Now, you know, he knows that somebody saw him and, or some, I don't know. And um, he's just kind of like has no communication skills and is treating me um, offensively at this point. And so I asked to talk to his supervisor. 
and I call a supervisor and I'm crying and I'm like kind of hysterical and I'm said I, I'm, I'm sorry you know I don't mean to be crazy but I, I just want he said he was going to do it and he didn't do it and the parole uh, officer supervisor says um, you know what you really should get some therapy <laughs> and um, I'm like really wow that never occurred to me thank you um so i just have to regulate you know he wasn't in my presence but you know i'm not gonna lie i definitely had some violent thoughts towards him and i was like this just was like this whole mess and i told him to i said look jody is supposed to be registered and you know california had three strikes and this would have been her third strike but Anyway, they gave her a pass, I guess, because she was a female, but she then she had to register. And the thing is about Megan's laws, I could um, see where she lived, you know, after they upgraded it and where Glenn lived. And it gave me a sense of power somewhat, you know, and Dawn, of course. But um, anyway, uh, some uh, random police officer in San Bernardino called and left her address on my machine. And... So I then knew where she lived, which of course was right by the college I was going to. And uh, also I started to run into her at Walmart, at the doctors, like all the time. I, and I'm always dodging and hiding out and grabbing my kids. And I really don't even realize at the time how much this is triggering me, except for I am trying to live my life and I'm not doing well. So I kind of got to the conclusion where, you know what, she's going to reoffend. Um, and I am obviously not a good mom, not a good wife. And so I should just go kill her. And then I'll be in prison. My husband and kids can move on. And, you know, just crazy thinking. And more than a few times I'm driving around her neighborhood and just thinking about it and calling my husband, Robert, you know, I just feel like this is what I need to do. And he's talking me down. And so did Orange County District Attorney's Office care, um, follow up a therapy, try to talk to me, help me out in any helpful way? No. Um, the positive that came from it is Dawn was put under civil commitment which is a whole law that if your parole officer thinks you're going to reoffend, they can do that. And then they're like forced into treatment, something like that. But they're housed, not in prison, but a prison, you know, hospital. And so he's out of the picture. And so this whole time, though, that I'm running into Jody, it turns out that she actually did reoffend. How did I find out? I found out through Megan's law. Because again, why would I get updates? Um, and she, I don't know if she got extradited out to Illinois or what, but you can read that it was an offense in California and anyway, whatever. So yes, I needed to put the anger where it belongs, but also learning to let go. You know, I want to move on with my life and I do that trying to do the best we can, raising our family, going to school. I, I became a therapist and I feel like I was doing okay, you know? Um, and we decided that we needed to move out of state because our sons, <coughs> the environment became not the best for them and the economy took a, a dump. And so we went to a state where my husband had gone to school for most of his life grew up most of his life there and um, so I couldn't go into private practice right away I had to work at agencies and so until that worked its way out and I was literally a crisis therapist for children who had just been placed in CPS care and at this point I had oh I <clears throat> I used to get like nervous and stressed when I saw an Orange County number but I was over that at this point. And I'm in my car ready to go get gas. And I now I have cell phones and the internet. And I see Orange County's calling. I'm like, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, solicitation. And I go in and I pay for the gas and I come back out. And um, it's, there's a voicemail. So I listen and it's 
Orange County District Attorney Sex Crimes Unit contacting me to see if I will testify for Don Gordon's civil commitment trial. And so I immediately, I'm like, yes, hell yes. Yes, I will do that. And, you know, I, I call back the investigator and I'm all amped up and um, he's like, wow, you're a therapist. You know, we could really use, you know, someone like you to testify. And I'm like, okay. And um, we make a plan to talk soon. And, and then I go through my day. And then by the end of the day, I'm like, don't lay down, don't lay down, don't lay down. But I, I did. And that was it. I know now, even then, even though I was a therapist, it still wasn't quite clear in my head. Like I triggered back into PTSD big time. And I started to not do very well. I, you feel it physically, you know, it's like walking through five feet of mud. You know, I felt like my life is ruined. Well, and I, I couldn't work soon. Like I tried to, and I, and I even, I told my boss to fuck off. Very professional. Um, because I, I just started decompensating and I couldn't keep up with the caseload. And I was like, whatever, my life is ruined. And um, yeah, I, I thought about taking my own life and I thought about, I don't know, I was not in a good place. One of the big reasons is I didn't feel like I was being treated respectfully by the investigator um, and the the lawyer, the attorney, and you know, he had asked me to get pictures of myself as a child and email them and I didn't hear and so I was just like, emailed him back. I said, you know, I'm not doing really well. Can you just let me know you got these? I'm trying to be really nice. I'm trying to regulate, I'm trying, I'm, but I'm not doing well. I, I'm not doing well. And um, I still don't get a response, I just, I said, look, I'm a therapist. I'm trying to just manage this. Anyway, um, it became a hostile situation for me, I felt. But by the time it came to testify, they, they flew my husband and I out. And I wasn't happy. I, I was, you know, somebody said to me, well, you, you don't have to, Lisa. But I... I had to, you know, I, I didn't know how to say no. And so we get to Orange County and um, the investigator picks us up and bottom line, it ended up where it seemed like he was cool, you know, like the victim advocate made no attempt to have a relationship look out for me. But I felt like, you know, the investigator was like, we're on a team. And so the next day it was time for me to testify and I, I never wanted Dawn to ever see me again, but that that was gonna happen. So <clears throat> I get into the courtroom and I get up and I'm sitting down on the witness stand and there's Dawn and I just stare right at him. And he's actually like, hey, like looking like, good to see you or something ridiculous. I'm like in my forties now. <laughs> The last time I saw him, I was 13. And um, anyway, I was, I stared him down. He looked away. And his attorney's like, don't, don't look at her. But I was able to get a lot out and testify. And, you know, um, in, in between, they had, we had to break for lunch in between my testimony and our, the investigator took us out and he was really nice and he said, Lisa, you know, you're doing really well and you should write a book. And I said, why, why do you say that? <laughs> He's like, I, I don't know, I don't know, but you should write a book. I said, well, if I write a book, will you read it? And he says, if you signed it. And I said, okay, so, um, so we're kind of buds now. And after the testimony and all that happens, he's driving us back to the airport. And I said, hey, can you, do me a favor, please, um, just when the jury goes into deliberations, can you please let me know when they're going into deliberations so that I can be at home and not out working or something, and then I can, um, you know, be in a safe place because I know it's going to 
I'm just all over the place emotionally. And he says, don't worry, Lisa, I will, um, I will contact you and let you know so you can go home and, you know, be prepared. Even if it's a good verdict, I wanted to be home. So a couple weeks later, <laughs> I get a call from Orange County. And so I'm out working. I'm like 45 minutes from my home because I'm traveling all over finding these kids. And um, it's the victim advocate. And she's like, Lisa, it's good news. And so now I know, wow, the verdict came in. I didn't know they were in deliberation. And she's telling me, and it's, it was good news. He was found true to be a sexually violent predator. But, um, but I don't know, I just felt awful that the investigator didn't tell me. And, and I was just like crying, going home, whatever. So my boss, the one that I had told to fuck off, like, she's really cool. You know, she's like, I'm working for her again. And I tell her what's happening. And she said, Lisa, just just tell just tell the investigator how you feel. You know, like may, maybe you can end on a good note. And so I'm texting him like, I'm sorry to bother you. And I I know you're really busy and I know your job is really hard. And um, I but I'm just really kind of bummed out that you didn't tell me whatever, something like that. And I want to end it on a good note. Can we end it on a good note? And he texts me back, do not contact me again. So there I go, spiraling down again. <sighs> anyway, so I, I was not well again, but I have to work. I have to go on with my life. I'm going to put the feelings where they belong. So I decided that I'm going to contact Orange County every single day until I get the opportunity to talk to the district attorney himself, Tony Rakakis. Um, I contacted Governor Brown, Kamala Harris, the attorney general at the time, um, Oprah, Dr. Phil, LA Times, Orange, Orange County Register, crickets. But somebody at the Orange County Register did um, forward my information, I guess, to who is now the new district attorney, Todd Spitzer. But his office, like he didn't talk to me, but his office says, well, we'll try to do something. Anyway, um, I had to end up letting it go in, in my time. One, one guy at one district attorney did kind of take me under his wing and, and kept me contact updated and stuff, you know, throughout the years, because it's been seven years now um, until he left. And that was really appreciated. But so, you know, I, I moved on with my life and just get, got the updates sometimes and, you know, trying to be the best therapist I can, actually decided to write the book. And, you know, just a couple of months ago, I'm in the grocery store and I see People magazine and there's Brooke Shields. And I'm like, please, please don't say something positive about Pretty Baby because throughout the years, I've seen her here and there on shows and she's never denounced it. And of course, in the article, she says it's one of the best films she ever made. So I get triggered again in the PTSD, kind of that crazy mind, you know? I, I mean, I don't mean to put people down that struggle with that, but <laughs> I have to put the feelings where they belong. You know, now I'm like, it's like, again, I'm walking through five feet of mud. Now I'm sad. Now I'm irritable. You feel it, you know, and now I want to use. And um, so I decided, okay, I, I started a petition at change.org, hashtag ban pretty baby. And Anyway, so that's that's all all I can do, you know. Whatever, however far my voice can reach, I have to do my best for my own survival and in any way I can, you know, be helpful with others. And so, what, what's going on now with your siblings, your brother and sister? Well, um, I I don't know where my sister's at. <clears throat> I think she lives in a state in the Midwest between her two daughters somewhere. Um, last I heard, she was still, you know, a tweaker, but um, we can't have a relationship. And my brother, I think he's able to work. He's a really good uh, machinist, mechanic type, but he's uh, had a sketchy life, too. Any history like your parents? 
history. Like the sex uh, ped pedophilia? Um, my brother is a registered sex offender in another state. Oh, he is? Yeah. I also, I know he's not well a few times when I've met with him. He says he's on meds now, but um, my, I know my siblings were victimized as well. You, you feel like both your parents were, were pedophiles? Yes. I mean, I think my dad was actively, you know, seeking boys to a certain extent. I mean, he later, he came out to us as gay, which was fine. Um, but he, uh, I know he had a boyfriend. My husband and I went to, his boyfriend died. His boyfriend was really nice. <laughs> and I'm like, why is he with my dad? But um, he died, unfortunately, and he lived in LA. And my husband and I went to clean out his apartment for my dad because my dad was pretty upset and there was all these daddy magazines you know like nambla information north american man boy love association and i'm just like okay and i and i know somebody that um said that my dad molested them i'll just kind of say did your brother have any problems with your dad yeah yeah and um I, I, when I found that out, I, well, anyway, I, I tried to be a good sister, but it's not easy, I guess, you know, for that, my sibling, it's not easy for me, you know, but I, I have been in therapy and, and after, you know, my last contact with Orange County, I ended up going into EMDR therapy and I'm an EMDR therapist. <laughs> um, appreciate you listening. What a childhood you had. Yeah, but by the grace of God, there go I. For real. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks for listening. I'm glad you're doing better now. Me too. <laughs> Life can be good. Excellent. Thank you very much.